some point overwhelmed by the data they have collected. Why is that? Why it is so hard to make sense of our data? Really? Why? Sometimes we are especially uh, more, as you say, uh, easier to access data than figure the numbers. Right. So, other other suggestions? What what is why do you feel overwhelmed? That sensation, that, that sensation, why it comes? Honestly, really, you are all researchers. You said you felt that. Sometimes we are just so well, we're asking questions, what you want to know, for example. Yes. I think, what have you done, woman? Because reality is more complex than your own research question. So, you have a lot of data that can mean a lot of things, and if you let them speak, you can go on forever to let them speak because they can tell you all or shape an entire new world. But at a certain point, you have to stop. Right. I think it's very easy to feel sucked into our data and feel like at the bottom of a hole where you see clearly what is in front of you, which is the size of this hole. But it's really hard to zoom out and see things from above, from the group, <coughs> catch the relationship embedded in the wider context. And this is precisely what NetMap does. NetMap is this research method that I want to present to you today. How does it work? Five steps. Well, of course, first of all, you have to identify a core question. For example, who influences the adoption of a certain technology in a given context? Then you ask the stakeholders, so the people that are involved in this activity, to identify themselves by using these little wooden figurines and some post-its that you place on a white sheet of paper. Once you do that, you go on by asking them to trace links in terms of comments, who has the right to give orders to whom, in terms of money, who pays whom, in terms of training, who trains whom. Then, third, uh, fourth page, you ask them to imagine or tell what are the priorities of each stakeholder with regard to that specific project. And as a researcher, you don't limit yourself to the first answer to that. You want to go deeper and try to unearth the worries, the fears, especially of those in a higher position, they might feel threatened by your initiative. So try to rephrase the fears that become a legitimate goal. goal. And so I heard the hidden agenda. And finally, you ask them to assess the influence that each actor has in achieving the final goal. And you do that by putting this, this beneath the the subject, beneath the figuring. The, the higher the disk, the higher the influence. This method, I think, is very versatile. I want extreme, you can even use it for your own sake, asking yourself, who influences the success of my PhD? Who are the stakeholders? Of course, me, but also my supervisor, also the university I'm working in, also the people I'm researching with. You can use it as a field research method, as an interview model. The narrative you will get out of this is very different from the classical interview because you have the graphical part beneath what they say. Especially if you're interviewing someone that is used to be interviewed because it's high up in the hierarchy, they have this set of pre-cooked answers they're going to give you in order to meet your expectations. But if they have to draw, they don't have that same self-conscious skill to package the thing the way you want it. So sometimes you can see they make the light and then they, you ask them to explain and they say, hmm, I shouldn't tell you this because it's politically incorrect. So from that mismatch you can get a lot of information. <coughs> you can use it in groups to bring together different perspectives, say of an NGO, an association, a community, community, or even if you have a, a bigger context a lot of people, you can do subgroups and multi-group things, like I did in my favor. So you can then compare maps and ask why is this so different? What are the differences? What are the analogies? 
And out of this, really, a very, very rich conversation comes out. I did that in, in Burundi, and I'm so glad that a Burundian is here. Okay. Uh, any, anyone else who's been to Burundi? No? Okay, I was there for five years working at ICT for Education, basically setting up computer labs in public technical high schools. And the last project I did was with a bilateral cooperation agency <coughs> from Europe. And ICT for Education, like probably like any other ICT for D program, is complex because of the diversity of the people involved. You have cultural differences, Europeans and Africans, you have disciplines that are different. The techies, the, the teachers, the staff in the school, the management of the development agency, very different take on things, mindset. So with NetMap, I ask everyone a question. Who influences the success of the project? So the setting up of the labs and the training of the teachers. And then I ask them to say who are the stakeholders involved. And of course, each stakeholder will provide a different set of stakeholders, a different list. Because the guy working in, rural, uh, in a rural school completely ignores the political game that is played at the ministry level and vice versa. So you as a researcher try to bring together these different <coughs> perspectives. How are they linked? You ask them to draw the the, the hierarchy, the formal hierarchy, the money flow, the training, <coughs> and then what is the relative influence of each actor towards achieving the final goal? Finally, what are the priorities with regard to the project? Not just in general, all oh, the Minister of Education has to foster education. No, but right there, for that specific project, what is it they want to get out? You can see that here, four and five are swapped compared to what I just told you a minute ago. Because at that time, I used to do first the assessment of the influence and then asking them to specify what they, want, what they thought the agenda of each actor was. But then I realized that doing the opposite is better because once you have clear the objectives, your assessment of the influence is also more precise. So I, if you want to use that, I would like to use it. Now, this is how it looks in reality. There's a big sheet of paper, like a flip chart. You put down the actors. You link them, different colors for different links. <coughs> then the instant towers, and finally the goals. And you see that the bubble posted inside every actor on the goals. Now, what are the requirements? Suppose you like it and you want to use it. If you do it in a group, ideally you better be a couple. One being the facilitator, taking care of the ongoing conversation, asking questions, clarification, and even maybe drawing on behalf of the participants, so that they have to be very, very clear with you to tell you why this line has to be drawn. Although sometimes it can be an impairment, because if they do it on their own, maybe it's more messy, the end result, but you get some information out of that mistake as well. And you need a note taker. Someone who is there, but not in the flow of the conversation, a step back that can really track the process and say, oh, how come this stakeholder was not mentioned, or was mentioned at the very last minute, although it's very important? What are the arguments where the polarization is, is much wider, that there's a lot of debate there? Why is that? If you don't have the luxury of a note-taker, you can opt for an inanimate note-taker, like a, a camcorder, but be careful not to rely too much on the video, thinking that the video captures everything. No, it captures just one perspective, either it's the map or the person. Yes, you have audio, but better combine this with some snapshot you take with your digital camera, because there you can tap, 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 take the crucial steps of the process, and the pictures are much more easy to handle in the analysis process because you know going through two hours of video footage ah, it's time consuming is it's hard it's, it's lengthy and you cannot publish a video on paper though. so the other thing you need is the toolbox this is very simple you know this is the first netmark toolbox ever these are made with bicycle ball bearing that you can find on any African market 
very cheap. I did this in Burundi. I asked a local craftsman to carve them for me. If you want, you can even buy this now on the website for $120. You have this sachet, this nice this, <laughs> a little bit of try-ons, a post-it of colors, and a CD with all the reference like that, the journal articles, academic articles on this method, the manual and everything like that. But if you have the time to put that together and a little bit of creativity, you know, one time I used carols because I had anything else. You know, particularly are not important. What is important is having something to represent the influence. Okay, you have that, you've done it, now what? What is the analysis? Look at this. This is the end result of the map that I showed you before. And here I mark with a sticky, uh, a sticky arrow. The green are Burundians, the purple are the Belgians. And you can see that for this interview, no wonder, no, there's no doubt who has power. These are the two, the two Europeans. So, big surprise, isn't it? So, but you don't have a method, I think, that can picture this distribution of power that is perceived so clearly. And this has a lot in terms of ownership, aid effectiveness, and all that, actually. Look at this instead, what I call graphical honesty. You see, if you listen to the audio of this interview, you don't catch how thick is this line. You only see it because it was drawn. So, as a researcher, it tells you, hmm, that's something to dig in there. I have to look better. Why is this so critical? And actually, the guy who the ministry guy could not be very open saying that there was a diplomatic problem there between these two actors because one was so pushy on saying where we have to go. It is hierarchy link. Okay, these are nice cues, you might say, but how do you handle the, the miserated spaghetti bowl? So the end <laughs> of the problem where you have this messy map with all these links, how, how does it work? Luckily, technology is very fast. We have the software. <laughs> so even techies can play around with it. Um, visualizer, you see the bubble size is proportionate to the height of the influence tower. So the bigger, the more it is. Still, looks kind of messy though. Then, visualizer allows you to highlight or activate only the layer of links you want to look at. So this, for example, is the formal hierarchy that I'm looking at. And look at the structure. When I change and I look at the training link, this is how it looks. You see how it changes. So you can go in and study thoroughly associated, let's see, I don't know, formal hierarchy plus money. Are there some interesting mismatches there? Or who is formally on top and who is on top from the money side? And out of this, understanding whether there are bottlenecks, there are missing links, there are fragilities and vulnerabilities in the system to really help you explain why what is happening is happening that way. So, the fact is the software allows you also to associate this analysis with the more classic social network analysis measures like centrality, betweenness, closeness, eigenvector. These are all measures <coughs> that come from the well-established field yes. of well, 20 seconds. <laughs> 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 in the field of academic, which is quite quantitative either. But then you can back up what you found from a qualitative point of view with some, some numbers that are very cool when you present that. So, if you want to give it a try, on netmapwordpress.com you will find all the resources, academic and non-academic, that you can find, that you can easily want, or uh, don't hesitate to drop me a line if you want some advice on that. Thank you very much.